Today's video is sponsored by Native Sons Goods, makers of premium quality guitar, bag, and camera straps, handmade in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Check out their website to order your own custom creation and play in style. And remember, when you support my sponsors, you support this channel, and I sure appreciate it. Hello everybody, Brad the Guitar just here. In today's video we have a, what I believe to be a 1972 Ampeg GU12. This thing was brought to me to have overhauled and that's what we're gonna do, we're gonna overhaul it. 12 inch speaker as you would imagine with a GU12 model number. This thing has uh, tremolo and it's uh, one channel with treble and bass controls. The tremolo has speed and intensity and there's uh, reverb which they call an echo which has a dimension control. Uh, we'll flip the thing around and check it out. It also has a normal and a bright input. Uh, we'll flip it around and check it out. This thing has a nice Jensen speaker, which is kind of unusual. I'm not sure if it's original or not, but it appears to be original. At least it's date coded 1972, and that uh, jibes with the year. So and here's the rear of the thing sitting down, and you can see it has a uh, it has a foot switch. I'm not sure if the foot switch controls both the uh, echo and tremolo I'm not sure um, I'm guessing it does 7591 output tubes it has a uh, 12 DW7 which is like one half of a 12 AX7 and one half of a 12 AU I believe it has a 6U10 which is a uh, GE compactron style tube it also has a 12 AX7. He said that this thing has been retubed recently and it was having some problems. If it's been retubed, the uh, 6U10 is probably good, so that shouldn't be an issue. That should have three triodes in it. Those are unusual tubes. They're getting increasingly hard to find. Yeah. Oh yeah, it did have a fuse. This, this, the outlet, the AC outlet's been taken out of it. We may do something to cover that a little bit better while we're in here. We'll see what we can do with that. But yeah, it should be a pretty interesting one. Uh, this one was built in Linden, New Jersey, or at least it was built while Ampeg was in Linden, New Jersey. Like I said, a Jensen speaker. Uh, and this one is date coded 1972. You can see there, 2072, 24th week of 1972. And it is a C12R. And again, I'm not quite. I'm not sure if this is uh, correct or not. A C12R for for a pair of 7591s. That looks to me like that's probably going to be a little bit. Uh, that's probably not going to have enough power handling for this amp. So I'm not sure why that would be in here. Maybe it's a replacement. I don't know. But it, like I said, it's the same year as the date codes that I saw in the transformer a minute ago. So. Anyway, we'll pull this thing out of here and uh, get a good look at it and and give it a good service. So one of the cool things about uh, Ampegs from this era is that they have these these I don't know what you would call these basically plates on the bottom of that they're actually attached to the uh, the chassis and the chassis floats. So the chassis is not actually connected to anything except for this and it's connected on these. Uh, sort of shock absorbers right here so the whole chassis even while it's in the amp uh, can kind of move around kind of keeps things from you know sort of jostling the other cool thing about the way that they've done this is that you can take a couple screws out you can see the screws here on the side and there's a couple more on the other side you take those four screws out and this whole thing just slides out and then you've got these stands right here kind of uh, act as a built-in you know chassis stand so you can you could sort of service this anywhere you are. The only thing I don't like is that it requires a special uh, nut driver and I'm not quite sure what these are. I've never really figured it out. I just use I just use straight head uh, screwdrivers but kind of kind of oval shape but not really not quite oval shape. Just a strange shaped uh, uh, nut driver there so we'll have to get that out basically with a flathead. That's what I use on these and I don't think this one's gonna work. No, I'll have to get something slightly bigger, but you get the idea. Okay, so it turns out this one's stripped, and uh, if I put any kind of screwdriver in there, it just spins, so I'm gonna have to uh, cut a slot in it.
Okay, here we are inside this thing, and let's talk a little bit about what uh, what they've gotten wrong, what they've gotten right here. One thing I would say that they've gotten wrong is that they're running these tubes upside down, and they're they have direct mounted them to a PC board, and it's just, I mean, you can see here. Look at the blackness over here uh, around this area. This is just from being cooked for decades. So that's not really good. If anything, they should have broken those out and hand, you know, hand wired this with a real board. The other thing they've got wrong is where are the components? I mean, the components are on the wrong side of the board, really. You wish they would have put them on the side that you could actually see, uh, but they have not done that. What you would have to do is flip this thing over if you wanted to change any components and, uh, or, I mean, you could do your measurements and everything on this side, but if you wanted to change anything, you would have to flip it. Uh, a couple of the things they've gotten right, though. They've run cables or wires to these various controls on the front, and they've broken those out into discrete components, so that's good. They've done that part right. Uh, the same with the input jacks. You don't really start getting uh, this stuff mounted to boards until well, along about the 80s, really. Here we have a schematic. Uh, that's included with this thing which is nice and right down here you can see uh, on for the date 10 of 69 and as you can see here Magnavox was the owner of uh, Ampeg at this time and Magnavox I believe was based in Indiana at this time so you know this is one of those eras where you know uh, big corporations were buying up smaller companies and things were kind of uh, kind of consolidating so here's our inputs two inputs into a half of a 12AX7 and then it goes into the volume control wait a minute this is an intensity control for what probably the trim I'm guessing that's for the trim and then it goes then it goes into the uh, tone stack volume control so after that it goes to the 6U10 that's these three triodes uh, the 6U10 is one of those um, Compactron tubes. Uh, the Compactron tubes were developed by GE in the mid-60s, and they were used a lot in televisions, and that's kind of what they were trying to do. They were trying to, uh, they were trying to get their parts count down for some of the TVs and stuff, and they were, so they were squeezing more uh, elements into one tube envelope and uh, the, the 6U10 is one example of that a compactron from the era um, and it just kind of carried over into the 70s my guess is uh, Ampeg probably had a lot of these still on the shelf and they were using them up at this time because uh, GE stopped making them at a certain point I'm not sure exactly when that was but they did stop making the compactrons at some point probably along the I would say along the time the Amp came out I would guess. But you can see here the other half of the 12X7 is down here, I, th I guess in the tremolo circuit. Yeah, this is part of the tremolo circuit right here. And usually these dotted lines, that's what this means. Uh, you can see the dotted lines are facing up this direction, so it tells you that the other half of the 12X7 in question is up here, and you can see these are these dotted lines are facing down, so you know that that's the 12x7 right there that's one 12x7 the 6u10 then you've got the 12w7 which is another it's it's just a half 12x7 i think a half uh 12 au7 in the same envelope uh then we have a 7591 push pull output cathode biased so it should be really simple and probably sounds fantastic here's our power stuff down here we have uh center tap six volt winding yeah I mean, you know fairly standard stuff uh, this one did have an AC outlet in it and and I thought at first that there were they had someone had taken the AC outlet out because it's punched through here and there's some there's a piece of tape over this but if we look inside the outlets still there but it's just kind of hanging on for dear life it's just sort of there and then you've got a it's interesting too because you have a, a fail safe fuse here so in case somebody like sticks a, um, and this is actually a great idea, more ant builders should probably do this, put a fail safe fuse, because what happens a lot of times is the stupid users of these amplifiers will shove like a piece of foil or something in here to try to by, you know, bypass, I guess they think they're being smart, but they're really being dumb. They try to bypass this or they stick a bullet or something in there, you know, to, uh, 
uh, bypass the, the fuse that's blown. And then what happens is this secondary fuse, which is probably a value slightly higher than this one, uh, will blow just to say, hey, stupid, you know, take it to the amp tech like you're supposed to. <laughs> Another interesting thing about this is this has definitely been worked on before, but the but it doesn't look like anything was really changed. Look at the leads and everything on this. It's just been, been kind of butchered up a little bit. So somebody's definitely been in here soldering around on this thing. And the other thing is too, it's not in here very well. Like these should be these tabs right here should be bent way over. Um, but they're kind of just barely bent over and you can I mean this whole thing is just kind of wobbly in here you got this resistor just kind of hanging up here in space with one end just flopping around then you've got the other lead going to right here why didn't they just put the resistor over the top of that I, I don't get it yeah obviously we're gonna have to clean all the pots and everything um, now that doesn't really worry me that that board looks burnt like that. I kind of expect that really at this point for that to have, because uh, 7591s kind of, they run pretty hot. So I sort of expect that. And it doesn't look like anything is lifted or anything like that. But probably what I'll do is, um, as a matter of course, is go through here, check all these soldering connections because I can see all of them pretty clearly. Yeah, you see like, that's not the greatest. That one right there looks like it has some lines around it. That one right there, not it's not not great. They're not the greatest soldering job. You see how they just don't cover out onto the pad. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna reflow a lot of this solder over here. Uh, I was thinking there was some more over here too. I was noticing a minute ago. Yeah, see, there's just there's not much solder even there on some of these. So I'm going to reflow a lot of this, add some solder. Anything that I usually replace on these Ampegs like this, I go ahead and flip it up to the top of the board. Um, I've serviced these before, and that's in, usually what I end up doing is just taking, if I have to change something out, I'll just drop it out the bottom and then just add it to the top of the board instead. So the next guy who comes along doesn't have to worry about taking the pan off the bottom and all that. Um, well, first thing I guess I might do is just get rid of this tape. But yeah, but definitely somebody, you know, push that in on accident. We'll fix that. I think it is. I think it's supposed to go in from the other side. Oh, I see. I see what the deal is. Okay. Yeah, this has got this is it's been cracked on one side. It's supposed to have uh, yeah, it's supposed to have some more material over here that hold that holds it in. You can see it's it's cracked off on the side right here, um, and it's there's a lip over on this side and a lip on this side, and this lip is gone. So uh, I could replace that, I guess, or do something like a add some epoxy or something to that but I don't I don't know if I've got one of those or not I could also just bypass it it's not I mean I don't think it's like anybody's gonna use this it's kind of an obsolete part there aren't many people who I mean most people now they use you know like a power strip or something they don't they don't use something on the app back of the amp I will probably just end up bypassing that that makes the most sense to me just to bypass it okay so I did go ahead and decide to epoxy uh, this back on and I think it's going to be okay. Pretty sure it should be. Uh, let's go ahead and, and also reflow some of this solder. Um, I'm going to start over here on this side because there seems to be, like I said, some of these pins are just barely holding on. So let's reflow some of this. better some of these definitely look like they were broken they didn't really have enough solder on them 
those were the main ones I wanted to get to uh, most of these are okay there's a couple over here though on the a couple of these I'll go ahead and do as well Those are the main ones I could see. Also, go ahead and uh, also go ahead and clean these pots while I'm in here. Might as well. I think I want to go ahead and fire it up and uh, just see what it's doing or not doing at this point. We've got steady power, steady DC right there on that first node. Pretty rock solid. It's not overdrawing um, power or anything like that. And there we go. 120 volts on the input. We're at 77 watts of power consumption overall. 0.7 amps and we'll just see how this uh, 375 it's right on dead on 370 you never see that that's dead on 375 volts I mean usually you're, you'll have you know 10% or up or down you know one way or the other within that kind of margin but that is just that's as dead on as it gets 375 for what it calls for on the schematic you never see that It is almost like we're mi we're uh, losing some power somewhere or something. It's not. It doesn't seem as loud as I would have expected it to be, even with this uh, speaker kind of out on the bench like this. You know, with the budget way I have it, um, I would have expected it to be a little bit louder than that. You know, of course, this is 7591 output tubes, so they're not going to be. You know, it's not like they're 6L6s or anything, but. tone say the tone is fantastic and it's about what I would expect uh, an Ampeg to sound like I mean it sounds great 
but it's just not that loud. Probably one thing I could do to make it a bit louder would be to change that uh, 12DW7 to a 12AX7. The 6U10 also is all, or those are always a bit suspect because, um, you know, they don't hold up all that well for one thing. And the stock that is out there on the market that's left, uh, you know, you never know what you're going to get with one of those. You might get one that's weak. It might have been in an amplifier already for, you know, 30 years and it might have been just cooked. It might have been in a television for 30 years and cooked, you know, and you just don't know it. So uh, that 6U10 <clears throat> is suspect just simply because of what it is. So it very well could be that... Uh, that that tube is a bit weak. It could also be that um, you know it's not it's not quite biased up to snuff. But I mean everything is just rock freaking solid. But again, uh, the there's there it seems to be that there's something wrong with the uh, tone stack because there's just the bass control doesn't really do anything. It does, but it doesn't doesn't seem to do very much until it's all almost all the way up. You know, the other thing about this is uh, the reverb unit, uh, let's see, there's the tank right there, and it uses up two of the triodes, so it uses this triode and this triode from the 6U10, and we have uh, where it splits off right here, it comes down, and then it joins back up over here with this 12DW7. I forget which uh, of these triodes is the weaker one, but it's probably this one, the one they're using for the phase inverter. Okay, so I've removed this, uh, I've removed this dropping resistor because it just didn't have enough lead to do what I wanted to do, which is, uh, which is uh, tied onto those posts. So that's on there now. Got a new uh, metal film in there instead of this. Also went ahead and removed that 20 microfarad capacitor, this old thing. And we're going to replace it. Let's see, this is... Gosh, that's a 68. Is that from 19... That's from 1968. Jeez, that had been on the shelf for a while before they put it in the amplifier. So, uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and get this and, and we'll get a new capacitor in there. Okay, let's change this power cord. This is still the two-prong original uh, power cord. So we'll just uh, clip this off. This is where our little Harbor Freight grommet set comes in handy. Might have to mix up some more epoxy because when I pulled on that, I thought it was, I thought it was um, set enough, but it, it really wasn't. So it kind of moved on me. This little outlet. So I'm, I'm gonna mix some some more epoxy and uh, probably put some on the inside this next time. But yeah, it's pretty much done. I'm going to mix up some more epoxy and I'm going to put it around the inside of this thing um, to keep this from going anywhere. We definitely don't want that moving on us because our power cord uh, is reliant upon that st staying there. So um, we definitely want to make sure that that's not going to move. 
but yeah, I mean, pretty much everything is, is good to go. I did go ahead and clean those pots again, the bass and treble pots. I don't think there's any problem with that board. So those should be good. I'll test the reverb as well before we button everything back up. I'll get the reverb tank back up here. The reverb tank actually has been changed. Accutronics and Belton, Korean made. There's the model number right there. Okay, so I added some more epoxy to this outlet, and I think it's going to be fine now. It's actually really good now. It's nice and hard. Hard. Also added some to the inside here, so it's not going to go anywhere. But yeah, this is not a design that I would ever advocate. As you can see what, what, they, what they've done here. They've just got these sockets direct board mounted. This is the big no-no in my book. Okay, the other problem with these six, uh, these six U10s and these compactron tubes like this, and again, this is three triodes in one envelope, and you can see there are the three different sections. The problem is I don't have a way to test this. I don't have a tester that tests for compactron tubes. I don't think my tester does that. But you can at least remove this bottom tr um, plate here and inspect the parts, which is what we're going to do now. <laughs> Okay, let's see what we have going here. Now clearly Ampeg used uh, used a lot of parts that we don't see a whole lot in the U.S. They used uh, a lot of uh, European imported parts. But yeah, these mustard caps, you typically see something like this in like Marshalls um, and other European stuff. You, you know, these same with these resistors. This is pretty much all European stuff. Here's the roach for the tremolo over here. And the tremolo works fine, so we don't have to do anything with that. We do have some bypass capacitors here that um, we could replace. This capacitor here also, that's the one for the output. And it would probably be a good idea to go ahead and replace that. Uh, we have a couple of 10 microfarads here of them in fact it probably wouldn't hurt to go ahead and replace those 